first is awareness. Why are you doing what you're doing? Mm -hmm. You know, what is it that, you know, what's that awareness? Awareness is key. So the awareness, oh, I'm not raising my hand right now. Awareness. Then advocacy. Making sure that you have your own advocacy rhythm going. You might have a great tribe and community and friends and family and everyone who are our advocates. Right. You've got to advocate for yourself first. Mm -hmm. The last A is action. So we can have all the awareness we want. We can have all the advocacy we want in terms of like, yay, I am who I am. But you got to take action. You got to take a step, whatever that is. Hey, sober people and sober adjacent people. Welcome to I Have 12 Questions. I'm Amanda Patton, your host, a leading expert on nothing. However, I am in recovery and I love it so much so that I launched this podcast where we get to talk to people who are trudging the road to happy freaking destiny across all the different ways that people get there. So While this is definitely through the lens of recovery and sobriety, the stories and the themes that we'll be covering are universally human. So love, loss, grief, excitement, parenting, outside issues, purpose, God stuff, whatever. In the words of the great Ted Lasso by way of Walt Whitman, I want to be curious, not judgmental. So like I said, we'll be talking to people in recovery. We're going to be talking to experts and practitioners who help those people along their path in recovery. And we're just really excited to hear people tell their stories and to be inspired by them and to create a community of support for everybody in recovery and people who know and love people who struggle with addiction issues and whatnot. So anyways, we're so glad you're here and thanks for listening. Hey listeners, just a quick disclaimer before we get into the interview. These episodes may contain adult language and subject matter that's not appropriate for all audiences. Also, we are not doctors or psychiatrists, so what we share on these episodes is certainly not to be considered medical or psychological advice, just our own personal experiences, which we hope will be helpful to others on a similar quest. So that's it, and thanks for listening. All right. Hey, listeners, I'm excited to welcome and introduce our guest. His name is Paul Larson, and he's the author of Find Your Voice as a Leader and finder, founder of Find Your Voice Coaching Institute, where he coaches professionals to break free from the limiting beliefs of imposter syndrome and shift from the mindset of a manager to a leader mindset. And he has served many companies and people among them, SAP, Twitter, Uh, Walmart, Kaiser, Permanente, and many others. Um, And of course, he's been sober for over 32 years. And so we've got a lot to learn from our guest today. And you can find out more about Paul and his work at paulnlarsen.com. Paul and his Nancy Larson, L-A-R-S-E-N.com. I'll put all this in the show notes for you guys later. But without further ado, Paul, welcome to the show. Oh my gosh, Amanda, with that introduction, I read mean, my imposter syndrome is like on full steroids right now. Like, oh no, that's not me. Oh, I'm a, oh are you kidding me? I'm a fake. I'm a fraud. What am I doing here? Did she really say that? Yes, she did. Because I wrote that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> Every time, it's really kind of interesting too, and we'll talk about it. I know every time I hear like a story about myself, which is accurate. Yeah. I'm like, wow. Like, yeah. And we don't do enough of that nesting to really listen, to understand like what you were just saying about me. I was sitting here like, Oh my God. Okay. 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 Stop. Okay. Stop. Okay. Stop. But really it's, it's, we need to recognize ourselves, and we need to really self validate who we are. Yeah. Because it, it's it's very true. So I just put all that out there because that's who I am, right? It's like like imposter syndrome. Here I am. You're imposter today. That's who you are, and that's what you've done. And I think that's interesting you say that because you know when I was researching you and I've listened to your things and I've read different stuff about you, and I'm like, wow, this guy's pedigree is intimidating. Like it makes you know, <laughs> I, I'm like, wow, I should have I should have done more. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want anyone to ever think that when they look at my pedigree, you know, you know, even my cat's not intimidated by me. Right. You know, it's like, like, like what, who are you? Just give me the food. Um, But I appreciate that. I appreciate your recognition and your validation and, and just everything you say. I really, really do. 
Well, you're a member of the Forbes Coaches Council, which is really cool. You've done 30 years of you have 30 years of business experience with Fortune 500 companies, and you've you've been and worked with and served really big name companies and been and and been working with big name C suite and directorships and all this kind of stuff. And so this is a kind of highfalutin, you know, uh, well pedigreed uh, type of thing. But the cool thing about that is, yes, it's impressive. Um, but also you're a real person, you're a whole person, you've got a recovery story to share. Um, you still have imposter syndrome, despite all the work that you did to like show that you're worthy of these opportunities. So I think that's the, the good part is, you know, listening to yours. And instead of just really listening, like you said, I was like comparing myself. It's just a, it's just, um, what we do for some reason right off the bat. And then if you can just take that second to say, no, that's not, that's not what this is. But so let's start with an icebreaker. Um, Cause you're all at all about leadership, organizational development, training, HR, um, and coaching leaders up on IQ and EQ. Right. Um, and I can't wait to hear about all this because I can only imagine that you deal with just the full spectrum of personalities. I can't even imagine the stories that you have to share. (laughs) Um, But an icebreaker, and this is kind of a hard question, but like what's your favorite memory in your life so far? Um, Growing up, your your question is so poignant. Um, So I'm, 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 I'm nesting myself right now to get this out. Um, growing up, like a lot of like a lot of kids, uh, when I was in school, I was maybe a little different, maybe a little unique. Which is now we we love to celebrate that, but <laughs> but in school that's kind of hard. And so I was picked on quite a bit. You know, um, I was bullied. Um, I was sort of the, the the odd person out, so to speak. So. Going to school for me was not always easy, especially for about two or th- about two to three grades, right? And I would come down in the morning to the breakfast table, and we had one of those like formica tables. And I just, I mean, I can just remember it as as you as you asked me that question. You know, the little napkin holder with the little green napkins, like whoever makes napkins green, right? But green napkins, and my mom's those plastic kind of table place call you know that had floral and it was very 70s the whole thing yeah (laughs) and it was always my mom there and so the the memory is my dad was traveled traveled quite a bit he was an airline pilot by by trade and so he was gone for 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 many mornings and my mom would be there at the breakfast table in her floral robe and i would come in and my stomach would be churning absolutely churning because I knew what was I knew what was ahead of me at school, and I wasn't sure if that day it was going to be this shoulder, that shoulder, the back, or wherever wherever kids would hit to hide things. They never hit in the face. Thank, thankfully, but they would they would hit in other places. And she would always be there, like like just this this sense of centeredness and groundedness. And my mom was. And, and she would be there and she'd go, okay, okay, here's what we're going to, you know, I can tell, you, you know, how are you feeling today? Da, 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 da. She wasn't someone who told me, okay, well, you could stay home or you could do, you know, it was like, how are we going to get through the day? Hmm. And what do you need to do to replenish the strength that you have within yourself, Paul? You know, in so many words. And she would sit there and she wasn't, my mom was mu- at the time much more spiritual, you know, she's not religious. So it was more spiritual and she would just kind of like, Give me this sense of groundedness and centeredness and like this pillar of strength. And, and she would either, she would say, let's, let's just talk together or let me hold your hand or let, let, me, let me read something that I'm reading. She was a, a, a very avid reader. And it would be those, what I would now call breakfast blessings. At the time, it was just getting me through my, right. my, 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 my bowl of cereal and getting me out the door. But those memories are seared up here. Mm. And they became the mosaic, a part of my DNA. 
to really propel myself. If I could get through those six or seven periods of classes that I had to get through, of which three or four were really painful physically yeah. and emotionally, with her, with her guidance and support, I could do anything. So mm. when you say memory like that, I mean, my life is blessed, so I've got tons of wonderful memories. But that sticks with me up until, you know, that, that, that is this, the, 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 the probably what has just guided me into who I am today. I love that answer. Because it's like it, you carry it with you in moments of distress and you use the word nesting, that, that grounding, that, that dropping in, which I don't care how old we get or how stable we feel or how much work we've done. We all are susceptible to those those moments. What a great thing to share. Thank you. Um, sure. So this is a podcast about recovery, but we are more than just part of, you know, that part of our lives. Um, so I want to talk about how your, you know, sobriety, you know, you've been sober for over 32 years, which is just freaking awesome. Like that's, 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 ma that's major. Um, Thank but you. how does it influence your coaching practice? You know, like, how did you get into coaching and public speaking and how does your, what you've learned in recovery experiences you've had in recovery, how does that shape how you coach people? Yeah. You know, so, you know, sobriety is one of those gifts that, um, you just keep unwrapping mm, yeah. and it just keeps on giving. It's like a perpetual birthday every day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what sobriety has given me, and I've given myself through it, so I, 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 pay, I pay close attention to my authorship of the sobriety. Mm -hmm. It's given me clarity. It's given me clarity of vision. It's given me clarity of purpose. It's given me the ability to, to, to think in the moment. You know, we, we, we all hear one day at a time, one hour at a time, one minute at a time. And when we really, really think about what that means, there's, there's a very deliberate vision that we can articulate through that. So I bring that into everything that I do. I bring that into the, the life that I co-create. I bring that into, you mentioned the coaching, the coaching that, 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 that I work with myself on, with my coaches, and then certainly my, my wonderful clients that I work with. So it, it, it brings me that inspiration, it brings me continuous sparks. It's kind of like um, when you're starting like a, a, one of those cars or engines that doesn't quite kick over when you're and it just kind of sparks. And that can be kind of cool because it's like kind of cool. It's like sparking. That's kind of what it can be like. And it's kind of like, whoa, this is kind of like an adventure. It's like a journey. It's like, what's going to happen? There's a the clarity and the curiosity. Yeah. It brought back the curiosity for my life. So that's what I bring to my coaching. That's what I bring, you know, I'm an introvert. So, so, so I get my energy from, from within. I need, you know, I love people and I love to be with people and I can speak on stage and do all this stuff with people. But when I need to replenish myself, when I need to, 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 to refill my gas tank, so to speak, mm -hmm. by myself. Yeah. And it's in those moments of tranquility. It's in those moments of, um, um, it's in those moments of, of, of nesting, as you mentioned. It's in those moments of grounding that I really think about and pay close attention to the, the gratitude, the graciousness, and the compassion that I provide to myself. Because yeah. if I don't do that, then what good am I going to be to anyone else? Right. You know, and, and, and so I, I, I replenish myself with that for, each, each day that I that I live, I'm human like anyone else. There's a there's a wonderful uh, I use in my speeches sometimes a, a wonderful slide that has like the big hello my name is name tag right yeah and it says hello my name is and it's got all these emotions under it <laughs> and they're all crossed it. you know angry just you know motivated inspired frustrated mad and they're all crossed off and the one word that's left uncrossed is human hello I'm human. Yeah. And certainly I have days that, 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 that are better than others. Certainly I have days that, you know, are, are, are that I, that I make mistakes. Certainly I have days where I have incredible successes and it's all just part of the journey. Right. 
And, and I think one thing that sobriety has taught me, and I've taught myself, I don't live with the regrets. Yeah. I don't live at all with the regrets of, 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 of my past experiences, my past lives, my past scenarios. And, and, I, and that's what I bring to my coaching as well, is, is we, can live, we can be so anchored in our past with, with what happened to us and our victimology and our regrets and it's such an anchor, and it just pulls and pulls and pulls. I, I, I don't have time for that. I want to release that and then move on. That is fantastic. Man, that's fantastic. Um, well, speaking of the past, you know how it is. We, we qualify. We talk about what it was like, what happened, and where we are now, what it looks like now. And we don't need to go into the whole thing. But I do want to know what your life looked at looked like when you arrived at the gift of desperation or rock bottom or whatever you perceive that moment to be where you were just like, man, I've got to change something. What, <laughs> what was your life like? You know, I love it because we haven't talked a lot, Matt Amanda. I love this because you and I are on, you know, we haven't talked a lot, but we're, 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 we're speaking um, the same language because it's yeah. like, that's actually kind of what I said was, man, I've got to change something. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it, so, so I thank, I thank the Lord. I thank God. I thank myself. I thank the universe. I thank source, whatever, whatever the faith is that we all have. Yeah. The, pe- the person I was really hurting was myself. Mm-hmm. And I thank goodness for that, 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 that I, uh, with in, in, my, in my moments of desperation, in my moments of, of the, the in, 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 in an alcoholic stupor, because alcohol was, was, was my drug of choice, was, my, was what I got sober on, um, or sober from. Um, I, I recognize it's like things were just happening in my life. I was very functional. I had a great job, good job. I had good friends. Um, we'd go out. But I started noticing things. And I had, it was like a spark of awareness back, and this was back in my 20s, right? And like everyone else, I'd, I'd go out. And then I, I would, you know, we'd, we'd plan to go out for the evening. I'd start drinking at like maybe two or three. Because by then it was like, oh, that's the afternoon. I can start drinking and drink, 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 drink more and more and more. By six or seven o'clock. My body shut down completely. Right. And I passed out. And I would pass out no matter where I was. So I might be in someone's car. I might be in a restaurant. I might be at someone's house. You know, I might be at home. But my body just, it, my body, it, it literally was like, okay, you're, all, you're AB switch, on off switch, you're, 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 you're shut down. Right. And this happened, this went on for quite a while. And, you know, I was drinking, you know, there's that, there's that part of drinking where, whatever I drank and it didn't really matter, but there's that click when you just have that, like, Oh, okay. Like maybe it's the fourth beer, like for me. Yeah. And it's just that there's that click where it like starts to feel like, Oh, it's kind of like, Oh, this is kind of getting kind of cool. Good. (laughs) And then you just go forward and you go more. Yeah. So you don't stop at four, you go into eight. Right. And, and you go more. And then I was doing this alone. Mm-hmm. You know, so I was like, oh, I'm a social drinker. I love to go out, blah, 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 blah. Um, but because I was also an introvert, although I didn't have any clue what that meant or what that was, I'd spend a lot of time on, by myself. And I would just drink and drink and drink to a stupor. And it was one of those moments by myself on a Sunday evening. And it was like about 6.30, 7 p.m., and, and I was like completely kind of wasted. And I had this spark of awareness that was like, man, this has got to change. What yeah. are you doing? I had no idea what that meant. I didn't even know. And, but I had enough of that. It was enough of something, the voice, to kind mm-hmm. of like anchor me. And I didn't know what to do with that. So I called a friend and I said, I... I think, you know, as I'm slurring kind of my words and they were kind of used to me by now doing this and they were like, and my friend said, she said to me, finally, she said, finally, Wow. she said, and, and from there I got into some recovery pieces and, and it became, you know, it became, um, uh, very apparent to me, you know, um, and I went through all the natural resistance and all the natural, no, I'm not an alcoholic, all that stuff. 
And then finally it was like, yes, I am. And it'd be easier just to admit it, Paul, so you can get <laughs> on with this and figure out what you need to do. And I always like to take the easy way anyway. So it was sort of like, okay. Um, right. And that was that. And I've never looked back from that. And it, 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 I'm not going to say it's been an easy road and it certainly has been, has its own, it, it, its own peaks and valleys and so right. forth. But it wasn't a rock bottom event like a lot of people had. Yeah. And I certainly, certainly have the stories. It was much more of a, of a rock bottom journey mm-hmm. that I finally found myself. And, you know, I had had my own situations and wrecked cars and so forth. But again, never, thankfully, never with anyone else. Always just with me. And I think it was my, my own way to say, you need to do something before you do affect and impact other people right. physically. Right. I was already doing that emotionally, but I didn't care about that at that point. Right. Yeah. And I, I love, I love that you share that, um, that when your friend said, finally, because there's this relief. And I remember the first time I was in a meeting and somebody said, welcome home. And I just started, I just broke down crying because there was yeah. something about that was like, okay, I'm going to stop fighting. Like, I guess this is where yeah. I'm supposed to be type of deal. And it, it was that beginning. Of, I'm not going to say I surrendered all at once because I absolutely did not. But but it was the beginning of right. like, let's just try this other thing because what I am doing obviously is not <laughs> working. Right. Um, what is something simple for listeners, whether, cause a lot of people who listen, they're not even, they're not sober that maybe they're thinking about it. They're checking it out. They want to know different people's approaches and what might work for them. Um, or maybe they're brand new in recovery or maybe they've been sober for 20 years, but what's something simple that you do on a daily basis to stay on the beam, you know, to stay balanced and grounded in your recovery and just in your balance in general. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm not a big um, journaler, right? People, you know, people love love to journal and, and all of that. Yeah, I journal up here, and again, this is probably part of my introvert version. Um, and so, I, you know, I figured I've already got all these voices up here. I might as well just add more up here anyway. <laughs> you know, it's all good. We don't. We only use like five percent of our brain power. So it's like, oh, I probably got. I probably got. You know, even with some of the cells I've destroyed, I probably got a few more left that I can that I can use, right? what I do each morning is I do like just a five minute recognition and five minutes can be actually quite a long time. It doesn't sound like a long time, but it can be. And, and I do a five minute recognition of who I am, what I am, what I will be. And sometimes the recognition is, is it's not always just gratitude. It's really recognizing me. And, and, and I call it kind of that self-advocacy because so many times we look elsewhere for our, ad, for, for our validation. Right. Um, and hence why social media is so, is so popular and can be just you know, a nemesis in, in so many different ways, although I love it, but it can also can work mm. against us. We've got to recognize ourselves. So I replenish my recognition and I just do a five minute sort of recognition. And literally it's, it's sitting no matter where I'm at, no matter where I travel, no matter where, and it's sitting and just recognizing my life where I'm at. It could be that minute. It could be in, 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 in that day. It could be recognizing a memory that you just brought up for me, recognizing my parents who were incredibly for myself, loving and caring recognizing that and it that if anything else clarifies my compass Mm -hmm. because our compass can get clouded and get all really kind of cloudy and it clarifies my compass in the direction i don't always know where i'm going i don't always know how i'm gonna get there and that's part of kind of like the fun things you know it's like and i don't always know where the next quote unquote you know it's not like i'm I'm rolling into tons of money and it's like oh well he can do this because of that oh I, I have to like, I, I, I want to segment out my life and, and, and fulfill my life and manifest certain things. But I do that recognition. Yeah. And I do it in such a way that it just is all kind of like, I call it my thought diary. Because 
we focus so much on what we wear, you know, we focus on the cars we drive, we focus on, oh, wh what food we're going to eat, where are we going to go for lunch? I don't want to go there for lunch. I want to go here for dinner. You know, right. We focus on things like that. We don't focus on the thoughts that we think. Right. And <clears throat> up here is, is, is incredibly like that thought diary that we have, whether you do it on, on paper or not, doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter. It's what we, it's the thoughts that we have. So yeah. I make sure that I start with these thoughts that are like rec, just incredible recognition and validation. And I that to that. me has, has helped me throughout my whole life. Well, to me, it's like checking in with your partner. You know, it's, it's checking in with yourself to see where you are that day. And it doesn't always have to be good because all of this good vibes only stuff. Sometimes I'm like, totally. Hey man, sometimes it's not a good vibes kind of day and that's okay. And for me, yeah. I need to be honest with, I'm feeling sad today or I feel tired. I feel disconnected or I feel, but I can still feel grateful and fulfilled and, and contented and also feel those other things. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Like, and that's what I had to learn that in recovery, that there's this full spectrum of human emotion and I can feel them simultaneously. I don't have to just be sad or just be happy. Like I can, you know, especially when you're going through a grieving process or you're going through different things in your life, you can still be grateful and focused on growth yes. and, and service to others while still being sad and nursing yourself, you know, your heart back to health. But if you don't sit still and check in with yourself the way you would with a partner or with a colleague or with a child or whatever, how do you know? How do you know where you are? Yeah. You know, and like you said, five minutes. I remember the first time I sat down, I was like, oh, I'm just gonna sit down and meditate for 20 minutes and like a minute and a half in <laughs> looking at the clock. And I'm like, it's only been 90 seconds. <laughs> meditation. Med meditation is an incredible tool. It absolutely is an incredible tool. So hard. And it and and it is. It's it, and and it's not something that is has been um necessarily just just that it's easy for me right and perhaps what i do in that written last five minutes is is is, is, is its own way kind of meditative right yeah. so it could be it could be classified that way right but i love 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 what you just said in fact i'm going to borrow that when i talk about my thought diary up here what i'm actually creating is what you just said is my own thought partner it's my own thought partnership with myself Right. And because we, we, we can have so many different, you know, we can run the gamut of all of our emotions. And we've got all these voices up here that can tell us all these different things. And some of them can be very strong and some of them can be the gremlins or the inner critic and all the judge and all that. It's like, that's who we are. We're human. Yeah. But to recognize that I don't ever want to be on autopilot. Right. And, and, and I want to be able to know exactly where I'm going to go. I can coast if I need to. I right. can go into maintenance mode if I need to, but I want it to be deliberate. Right. And so many people live, as a coach, I, I run into people that, you know, I, I ask them, like, I, I, like, I, like, I'll go into an organization, I'm going to coach them, you know, coach a leader there. And it's like, well, tell me a little bit about what do you stand for? Who are you as a leader? You know, what's your legacy? What's your, who are, you know, what's your brand? And they look at me and they're like, I came to this company you know, and I was going to stay, you know, about a year, a couple of years. And here it is 10 years later. And I have no idea. Like things can happen so fast in life and yeah. time can just go whiz right by if we just go into an autopilot mode. And it doesn't mean that you, you can't be successful. And it doesn't mean that you aren't taking care of yourself and your family and whatever you need to do. But oh my gosh, to just be on autopilot all the time, we're missing out on everything that, that life has to offer and everything that you just said, the highs, the lows, right. the happies, the sads, well, all of that. That's all part of who we are. And that observing that you're doing, you're, you're, you're having that dialogue with yourself, you're checking in, you're kind of seeing where things are. But for me, I stopped trying to change it or fix it. I just observed it. It just, I just want to know where I am today and understand what's going on with myself and not need to fix it or change it. Just, you know, but cause my personality where I want to swoop in and fix things and clean them up and make them nice and neat and not have to deal with emotions. And, you know, <laughs> and yeah. so what you're talking about yeah. is just this Rumi has a quote or a poem called the guest house. And it talks about that, like 
sometimes you just got to let all the yes in. Um, and, and sometimes those feelings can be difficult, but we're conditioned sometimes in our society to just pretend to be happy all the time, pretend like we always have it all together, you know, to project something into the world that may not be true. But I think we're getting better as a society of being more honest and, and talking about things. And, you know, I'm at the point now where if somebody asks me how I'm doing, you better really want to know how I'm doing because I'm not going to just say fine. <laughs> you know? So Right. Well, and what you're, what you're, just what you're touching on there is just the science of how we are. Yeah. The science is the to-do list. The science is I'm fine. The science is how are you? The science is the checklist. It, it, it will get us places. It can right. make us successful. It will get us a job. But what you're talking about is not just the science. It's the art. Right. It's the art of, of creating our own canvas, creating our own work of art, creating who we are. It's bringing our vibrancy, our colorfulness, everything, of, of, of all the sparks and, of, 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 and all the emotions. Right. And conventional wisdom, to your point, has been in the past. Ah, no, 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 no. You don't do that. You, yeah. you answer it this way, you do it this way, and da, 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 da. even today, when people when people are looking for a job or they lose their job, they go on LinkedIn and you know LinkedIn's wonderful, wonderful platform. But there's an algorithm that they okay, you got to do this, you got to get your network, you got to get your spreadsheet, you're going to do this, you're going to da, 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 and you follow that, right? But you're not even looking at the bigger picture. There's a reason you're in that job search or that next landing or that next career for whatever happened. Right. What is it that you actually, what is it that you want to vision for yourself? And that's the art of, right. of what you're talking about. Well, does sharing about your personal life in your professional, you know, practice help? Like, because a lot of people, there's still a lot of, you know, and I'm talking about how, as it relates to recovery, because there's a lot of stigma still attached to it. And some people don't want to talk about that because they don't want to pay the price potentially, you know, career wise. Um, sure. and, and also just, you know, with that, do you have struggles with boundaries of like certain groups or certain individuals knowing how much to share, um, you know, learning how to do that? Cause you've had many years of experience now coaching and being, you know, pedigreed professionally, but also weaving your sobriety into that. So I'm just curious, like how that, how that plays out for you. That is, that is a brilliant question because <laughs> It's been something that it's an art, not a science. There you go. Right? It, 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 it's completely an art. Let me give you just a quick example of just happened uh, just two, three weeks ago. I was blessed to be able to speak at, an, at, a, at a big HR uh, conference over in the Philippines, over in um, Manila. And, um, and it was like I, I, I got on stage and the guy that was introducing me was a, was, a, was a wonderful colleague. And he goes, what do you want me to say? Paul, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to say? I'm going to be introducing you. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I get Frank. Frank's a great guy. I get to, Frank gets to introduce me. And I wrote this introduction for the first time, Amanda. And it said in the introduction, I made it kind of lively. And, and, and it said, sober for 32 years. And it was one of the first times... I had actually had that in my intro where somebody was going to voice that about mm -hmm. me, just like you did, to an audience. And I had no clue. But it was who I am. And it goes back to what you asked about, you know, what, what does sobriety, what does recovery, what does that bring to you? Well, the reason I'm sitting, I'm standing on this stage talking to this, this incredible group of hundreds of HR people is because I made a decision 32 plus years ago, Right. And, and it gave me that clarity. So when he, so, so, so I was out there and, and when I was on stage and Frank was introducing me and he said that, spontaneously everyone started clapping. Oh. They just started clapping when he said that piece. Wow. And I completely unexpected. And my heart just filled up and I got emotional and it was like, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, it was like, oh, you know, it was like, this is incredible. And that was an art in terms of, do I share that or not with that particular community, yeah. that particular group of people? Yeah. Yeah. And I go and, 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 and you, your question is, how do I determine that? How do I set the boundaries? Because boundaries are so important, especially right. in recovery, especially in life. 
I go with my gut or my heart as well. So I, I, I try to take the ego out of it. It's like, oh, sober for 32 years. Everyone wants to know that. That's going to be, you know, that's a, that's a key. Or the opposite. Nobody wants to know that, Paul. Nobody wants to know that. Those are both ego things speaking. Right. Yeah. So I try to take that out, di- dilute that, and come into much more of like, okay, this community, how will they, you know, how will, will, how will it serve them to know that? And that's the key. You mentioned it earlier. How do we serve others? Because that's what I always look at doing. That's, that's what I do, right? So how will it serve them to know that about me? And I make that decision based on that. I, I don't come that. out of the gate. Okay, some people might want to wear the sandwich board and all of that. And, and, and it's like, and, and the bells and whistles, beautiful. That's them. You do you. Right. But for me, I, for me I'm going to like share very deliberately and very purposely. Yeah, I love that. That's such a great answer and like following your gut and really understanding who you're talking to. And also to to the fact that you were talking to HR people who a lot of times are dealing with employees who may need an employee assistance program. They might need some type of help. Their performance is bad and maybe there's some addiction thing going on and there's this sometimes a lack of awareness. And I think, you know, that's you probably the ripple effect of that you'll never fully know, you know, but like also yeah. and Brene Brown and all kinds of people talk about it all the time now is that we are so hungry for vulnerability when somebody shows oh, us something yeah. because we all feel so armored up all the time. And so if somebody else shows us something that is a secret of theirs or maybe, a you know, a personal thing we fit at for me, I just it's like a sigh of relief. I feel like I can trust that person. I feel comfortable. I feel like I'm now more willing to, you know, be more vulnerable and. It's, it sounds cliche, but it's it's true. It's why recovery communities work, I think, because we need that, um, you know, feeling of belonging um, and acceptance and this ability to get to know people at a deeper level than what is so superficial and vapid sometimes in our, out in our world. Like you said, what am I wearing? What am I driving? What kind of house do I live in? What's my title? And it just, you get to get past all that and get to know something actually core, to another human being, which we need desperately. And I feel like, you know, we don't have it quite as much as we used to. What about this negative self um, talk and imposter syndrome? Is that hardwired? Is that just like hardwired in every human being? Or like, what is that? What is, what is it for? Yeah. You know, so, so that's a great question. I don't, um, whether it's, hardwired or not, I think is up to the individual. Right. Um, even things that are hardwired can be rewired. Right. Yes. So, so, you know, I, I had it occur, you know, imposter syndrome has been around. It, it was, it's been coined and it was been, it's been identified since the late 1970s. And it, it's, it's, it is a thing. It is a, it is a true thing. It's not really a syndrome. It's more, right. they call it a phenomenon, but syndrome kind of caught on for the medical term. Um, but it's been around for for quite a while, and i i started I started noticing these feelings back in like two thousand and four, two thousand and five, and I had a great job. I was head of HR at a great company, and 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 I was doing lots of things. And but I kept feeling like, do they really know that I don't know, have any clue what I'm doing? That do I really belong here? That I'm kind of a fake or a fraud? And here's the clink, here's the here's the clincher with imposter syndrome, is that you have these feelings, which could be just attributed to lack of confidence. Sometimes people get confused about that. But with imposter syndrome, you think you're going to be found out. Yeah. You're going to be unmasked. And I kept thinking that, like, and it was kind of like, what is this? Like, who's gonna find me? Like, what is going on? And and you're gonna be found out and you're gonna be asked to leave, right? Or you're gonna be like escorted out. And I remember talking to my mentor about this. And she says, well, do you feel like a fake or fraud sometimes? And I go, yeah. And she goes, do you think you're gonna be found out? And I'm like, yeah. And then she's speaking the language and I'm like, yeah. And she, and she goes, well, who's gonna find you out? And I said, I don't know, I mean, just, they, they. And she goes, oh yeah. She goes, that's imposter syndrome. Just like that. She went just like that. 
And I said, "What? Like what? Well, like 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 she had, like 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 everything opened up and the lights came on and the music played, and I was like, and I leaned into it more when I found out really what it was, and right. it was like, wow. And here's the best news about it. It's it's experienced by eighty to ninety percent of successful professionals. This that's not a performance issue. Right. It's not like something you have when it's successful professionals, and and everyone from from all these people in the public domain have admitted it. Like you were talking about Brene Brown and how she talks about the vulnerability and all this. You've got Howard Schultz, who's the former CEO of Starbucks, who has talked at length about imposter syndrome. Yes. Michelle Obama has talked. She goes, I still have imposter syndrome. It creeps in. Can you imagine? Um, you've got you, Tom Hanks. The, I know these people who we in the public domain would look at and say, well, they're pretty successful in what they're doing. They still have it. And so when you, when you, when you, when you, when you trickle that out, it, it, it can affect so many people, yeah. but it's not talked about in organizations. It's not necessarily something that people like kind of bring up. And what I find as a coach is I work with leaders and organizations across all genders, across all age groups, across all industries, across all types of positions, and it affects everybody. It, 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 it's an equal opportunity syndrome. Um, they used to think that it's like, oh, it, it's a woman thing. It's, it, it affects females. And it's like, no, <laughs> females will admit it. <laughs> they admit it, yes, because they show the they show the emotional intelligence to say, right. um, hello, yeah, I, I'm, I'm. Now it's 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 like I, what I see across the board, and what studies have shown, recent studies have shown, it's like fifty fifty. So, whether it's hardwired or not, uh, uh, so many people have experienced it. I've lived with it now, and so what I go back to what you and I talked about earlier. I try to find the easy way, right? So. You, you, when you Google imposter syndrome, you get a lot of overcome imposter syndrome, get over imposter syndrome, you know, get rid of imposter syndrome. I'm like, oh, sounds so tiring. Like anything to overcome, it's like, you know, it's like, I don't want to yeah. overcome it. I want to make it work for me. Yeah. I want to like figure it out and integrate it in a way. So it's what I've done with it um, and what I work with my, my coach, my coaching clients on, but certainly with myself is. Whenever that imposter voice pops in up here, because we have lots of voices up here, right? Yeah. But whenever with that imposter voice pops in, you're not good enough. You know, you don't belong here. What are you doing here? You're a fake. You're a fake. You've got to tell them you're a fake. You really don't know what you're doing. When that starts in, I just immediately like go back to what we talked about, the recognition and the gratitude. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. That means I'm doing something new. It means I'm trying something new. It means I'm being curious. It means I'm being courageous. Being right. vulnerable is courageous, right? Yes. And it means I'm doing one of those things. So whenever this pop pops up, and, 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 and granted, over the course of the last few years, it pops up less and less because I'm much more aware of it. Right. But when it still pops up, Amanda, I'm sitting there and I could be in any kind of like situation and it's like full on like, Whoa, here's the, here it is. I just like acknowledge it. I'm aware of it. I recognize it. I validate it. And then it just kind of dilutes itself. Yeah. And, 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 I, and, I, and I bring it out to be a really good thing. What I don't do is kind of the classic reactions, which is avoid it, avoid any kind of getting myself in a situation where it will come up, right. um, you know, you know, you know, hiding, hiding yourself from it not going for that promotion, not raising your hand and in, 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 in whatever that might be. That's what the classic stuff is. The imposter wants to keep you safe. When it's like, stay in your comfort zone, stay here. I'm keeping you safe. Actually, right. it's trying to make you, you know, do a good thing. It's, it thinks it's doing a good thing. Right. You know, don't do that. You're going to look foolish. You're, you're really not, you're not, you know, you're da, 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 da. But in a sense, you're, you're actually stepping out and you're really being courageous. And that's how I, that's how I view it. And so it goes back to the thought diary and the thought partnership that you talked about. That's, yeah. what, I, that's what I bring in. And it, it totally ties back to, I mean, that actually covered my next question too, was like, what are some things we can do to start to shift that? And you just, you just answered that as well. And it's like, 
for me, I stopped, you know, we, I stopped fighting. I don't fight stuff about myself anymore. <laughs> I look fight. at it, you know, you look at it, you examine it, you ask what it's trying to teach you and you kind of befriend it, but then you also put it where it belongs. I don't, I don't need to yeah. make fearful de- decisions from a place of imposter syndrome. I need to see it for what it is and say, thank you friend for trying to inform me about whatever. Exactly. And then like move on. And for me, and I'm, I have a pretty spicy personality, so I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but sometimes the people who are 100% confident all the time, who don't have imposter syndrome have nothing to be confident about. Okay. And the people, (laughs) the people who are crushing it and working and working on themselves, they are the ones, we are the ones who, who doubt ourselves or am I doing enough? Or I got bullied when I was younger or I didn't receive the validation I needed. And so I'm always needing to prove my worth and prove my worth. And at at some point for me anyway, I don't know if it's age or sobriety or all of the above, but I just don't care anymore. It's like, and if I don't know something at work, when you just say, I really don't know. Sometimes that's the best thing yeah. you can say because it a it's the truth, b it garners respect from your team, um, and then you go find the answer together. You know, instead exactly. of exactly pretending to know what you exactly. know what you're doing, because a lot of times you feel confident about whatever the project is other times, not so much, you know, but I love it when a leader is like, I'm really not sure we need to, we need to really, exactly. You know, what's wrong with that? But old school, you would never, you would never say that, you know? No, you wouldn't because it's based on fear. Yeah. So when somebody is pontificating and they're so overconfident and that can, that can then lead into arrogance and so forth. And we see that all the time in leadership roles and things like that. Right. Um, It's based on fear. Fear of not knowing, fear that 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 I'm going to lose control, fear that I'm not, you know, I'm going to be viewed this way. So it really comes from a place of fear. Yeah. And that fear is what you talked about. It's friction. And I'm like, oh, I don't want friction in my life. I want <laughs> flow. I want things to just kind of like, I want to sit back and just kind of <laughs> let myself kind of flow and just like, let's see what happens. And it's like you're going down the river or whatever it might be where we're flowing. Right. But 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 life can be f- have full of friction if we choose that. Right. And the people, to your point, um, that that are so overconfident, it's like there's no there there. And when you touch on that, when 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 you touch on that, that aspect of it, usually then it, it, it just you get more of that, you know, it becomes just on steroids. Yeah. And 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 again, we can see that play out in so many different ways. Um, with our family, our friends in the in the public domain, but it really takes like the the person to your point to be courageous, to be vulnerable, to say, "I don't really know, but let's find out together," or "or I'll find out for you," or "Never had this happen," or "Gosh, I made the mistake." Yes, I'm it's sorry. It's my fault. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said that. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't do that. You know, instead of you, 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 and which is again, ba- it's based on fear. And it yeah. comes from, you know, Carol Dweck's book, Mindset, right? It comes from the, the fixed mindset. We can have multiple mindsets, but the, the fixed mindset versus the growth. And growth is where flow happens. It right. can also be messy. It can also be like full of all different things, but that's where we grow. That's where we like, okay, I want to I wanna, I wanna try this out. But if we're fixed, then things are going to be like this. We're going to be in our box. That's right. the science of everything. Every every place has it. Every every box has its place. Every 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 person has its place. We don't disrupt it. That's not the way we've done it. We've never done that like that before here. You know, all the statements. No, I don't. There's no feedback necessary because I am who I am and I don't change. You know, that's a very fixed mindset. And there are people that live like that. Yeah. And and good on them. Yeah. I'm not here to fix to your point earlier. Not here to fix that. If there one of the things as a coach I always have to assess and I always used to have to do this in the corporate world is coachability. How coachable are you and how do you know? Yeah. You know, so so if I'm going to be working as a coach with somebody, I want to know like okay, like how coachable are you? But not just, oh, I'm very coachable. Da 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 da. I, I do, you know, but how do you know that? Give me the empirical data, the empirical evidence, your journey to show me that you have been coachable in, in, in somewhere in your life, somewhere right. in your career, somewhere in your relationships and so forth. 
but friction, excuse me, flow, not friction. Yes. Is, I love is that. what I always attribute. That is, that is fantastic. Um, what is the most transformational project you've ever worked on? It could be like from a company perspective or even a personal perspective besides yourself. <laughs> <laughs> You know that's a great question, um, and you know the, you, you, I, I'm glad you I'm glad you put the caveat in there because the short answer is yeah hello me um, yeah well done you know, we are ongoing projects yeah and yeah. We're, we're we're just you know we're, it's 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 ongoing transformation you know I don't know if there's I mean as a in, in the corporate world so here's the here's the piece I love I love I love what you said I love I love the term transformational project. In the corporate world, uh, where I worked for, you know, it's like, I, and I loved it. I had so much fun, and you know, I had my highs and my lows, and all of that. And we always do these large scale transformative change projects. They were called, yeah. you know, corporate speak. Right. And it's like, oh, and you have your project plan, and you have your project teams, and they all meet, and then you have your status meetings, and it's like an eight month project. Maybe it's even longer. And oh, my word, it's going to just change. It's going to be enterprise wide or org wide. Oh, my gosh, it's just so huge. And nine times out of 10, those, those projects always failed. Yeah. Because you don't, you, you looked at it without looking at the stepping stones, without looking at the baby steps. Yeah. So when I look at transformational projects that I've worked on, the ones that have been the most successful for me are the ones where we took the baby steps necessary, brought in the psychological safety so that people could make mistakes, we could learn from the mistakes, just like babies get up and 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 and, and you know wobble and they fall back down. Then they get up again, and then they might need some support, and then they hold on to something. Then they take a step. Then they fall back down. Then they get back up. Those types of projects, and the one project for me that that I worked on was my book. That my book was one of those things where. When I started writing the book, I didn't realize. I thought, oh, it's just going to be like, you know, plug and play. Because nowadays you can just write a book and, and, and publish it tomorrow or right. even tonight, right? Like, and this was a few years, this was even years ago. And, and, and I didn't realize. I didn't realize how transformative it would be for me to write this book. Because it was about... Finding, you know, the, the, the finding your voice, which by the way, that whole, that whole tagline was given to me by a client yeah. who said, you know, Paul, you help us find our voices. That's what you do. And when I heard it, it was like, what a, what a, what a, what a wonderful gift, right? Yeah. To a client to tell me that. So I kind of figured like, we have all these voices up here in our heads. So let's, I'm going to help us find our voice. That's going to lead us in our life right? Find your voice as a leader. And I created then a model out of the word voice. And again, I approached it just like a science project. Okay. Mm-hmm. If A equals B, then I'll get C. You know, I was, I was approaching it like this. Yeah. And then one day, Amanda, I was really stuck and I just couldn't like, I, I was just, you know, it was one of those days you talked about and it's like, we're having our highs and lows and happy and sad and everything. And I looked at this, I looked at what I had written so far, and I looked at kind of like all my notes and the manuscript and all this stuff, and then it just hit me. The, the voice, the, 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 the model, the acronym was me, was my life. I was making it third party. Mm. You know, V is values, O is outcomes, I is influence, C is courage, and E is your expression. That's, you know, I created the model. Right. But then it was like, hello, it was my story. It was what I went through. It was what I went through from sobriety. It was what I went through with my parents' transition, their passing, and my sister's passing, and all the things that had occurred in my life that, 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 that had kind of ripped me open and broken me open. And then kind of, I put myself back together again and kind of kept going and you get, you know, get broken open. Sometimes you put yourself back together. That's what it was. And it was like, oh my God, Paul, what are you doing? You don't write this in the third party. 
this is you. And it was so transformative what I had. It was like, it was kind of like, it was, this is back 2014, 2015. It was like my second sobriety moment. You know, I told you I had the first one was like, what are you going to, you know, man, you got to change. This right. was my second moment of like, ah, and it was very transformative for me. And at that point, that's when I owned it. Right. And that's where I said, my life is the journey. My life is the story. It's not that people want to read about my life. It's not, it's not about that, that part of it. It's a part of how does this come into who you are and right. how do you bring that vulnerability, all your mistakes and all of that into, into your story. And what I love about that too, is that you were able to bridge the head space and the heart space and then integrate it in a way that can serve others, right? Like the yeah. lessons that you learn, then it's easier and safer to me anyway. And I'm still this way. This is my 10th year in recovery and I, I work really hard on it on a daily basis, but, yes. but I, but I still, my go-to is that science thing. Like we got to have a T chart and a grid and a spreadsheet. And if I, <laughs> and it makes me feel safe, it makes me feel safe because yeah. it's predictable. Yeah. I implement software for a living. That's, that's what we okay. do. That is a very uh, predictable guess. What's really predictable. The technology for the most part, guess what's not predictable at all human beings. And so the change management the human being. is the hardest Absolutely. part. And if you don't have EQ in that job, like you said, this digital transformation enterprise wide it's not, if you didn't address the baby steps and the human beings involved in the process, it doesn't matter how good that technology is. It's not going to stick. And it's the same with recovery. I can read all the books and work all the steps and go to all the meetings and sponsor all the people. But if I didn't do the inner work and if I don't keep looking at that stuff on a daily basis, I'm not integrating. I can be a good, and I tried that in AA too and, and other 12 step, you know, things. I, I was a really good student, but I wasn't practicing. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. You know, I learned, I, learned, I memorized things, but yeah. I'm sure as heck wasn't doing it in my life. So, um, you know, you, what you're talking, what I love, what you're talking about too, is the blending. The science is the IQ right. and the art is the EQ. Right. And like anything, the whole person is both, but you know, we and companies so much. So, you know, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, companies focus so much on the IQ, but they have to recognize like IQ will get you in the door. It normally is what gets you in from the interview and the right. onboarding, but right. EQ keeps you there. EQ develops you. EQ grows you. EQ creates that, that the culture and you've got to blend both of those together. But to go from an IQ sort of mindset, which can be fixed and science oriented, takes a vulnerability to blend into and even introduce the EQ concepts. That's what I find. Because I work with a lot of tech, tech companies. I work with a lot of digital tech, social tech, traditional tech. And, and, and the, you know, the, the, the architects, the engineers, programmers, they have such strong algorithms up here. Yeah. As we all do. Yeah. Their algorithm is constantly going. Their hypothesis is constantly going. You have to learn to kind of break that. Yeah. You have to learn to kind of stop that. You have to learn to kind of slow it down to introduce. And even though you and I can sit here and talk, you know, 10 years recovery, 30 years recovery, and we've done this and done that, but it's not without its own struggles. Right. It's not without its own, its, its own mistakes and setbacks and everything else. Well, for some people, just for them, they've been recognized for their IQ, for them to even think about the components of, of emotional intelligence, the empathy, the motivation, the self-awareness and all the humbleness and all those things that it takes incredible courage that takes mm -hmm. incredible steps out of the comfort zone. And those steps to your point have to be baby steps. Yeah. And what happens is we don't always do that. We say, you have to be this, right. you have to go from this to this. You don't do that. Right. Most of my clients, when, whenever they've, they've been focused on that or whenever they have um, um, management or leadership who want them to change and want them to change fast, it's not going to work. And, and, and when they get feedback or they get that data about who they are as a leader or how they are, like on a 360, yeah. that feedback alone 
can be earth shattering on yeah. so many different levels and they have to learn to nest with it and they have to learn to like, okay, now what do I do with this? But many times organizations will say, okay, change right now, change this, change that. Just go again, applying science to a very artful experience right. and it doesn't work. And it doesn't stick. That's the reason why it's so difficult um, because empirical data um, these algorithms that's either right or it's wrong, right? You can prove it out right. It's right or it's wrong. And with emotional things, humility, EQ, there isn't just one answer that <laughs> multiple things can be true at the same time. And it's messy. And people who are wired the other way, I find it very uncomfortable because I don't know what the answer is. And that makes me feel uncomfortable. What is the answer? Right. <laughs> right. And with people, I've, I've been, I, I, you know, I, go ahead. I, yeah. I love what you're saying because it just, it takes me to, people I've worked with and clients I've had and like, like sponsors I've had in the corporate world that are, that are, that are leaders of, of coaching clients. And they're like, Paul, is it yes or no? Is it, is it yes or no? And I'll look at them and say, maybe. Yeah. It depends. You know, maybe. Yeah. It's not, but it's, and, and I said, and, 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 and you, we have to connect that and that can make people very uncomfortable because in the growth mindset, nothing is always static. Nothing no. is always just just rigid, and yeah. it's it, it, it and, and growth mindset is flow, and growth mindset is 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 integration. So yeah, it's it's, and but but it goes back to what you talked about earlier. We have to assess people's boundaries and their coachability and their readiness to want to adapt or accept that in whatever role they might be playing in our lives, right? right? And that, that comes from here, comes from our heart, comes from our gut to be able to do that. There's, been, there's times where I don't introduce who I am in certain ways based on just what you were saying. Yeah. Because it would be like too much. Yeah. And I, and I, can, I can assess that guidance. And, and that, again, that brings up my, my own curiosity, my own navigation of how right. I navigate myself through life. Well, and to me, that change happens over a, sl a slow period of time, usually. But also, in order to change, you have to try some new things and fail at them and, and figure out what worked and what didn't work about that. And then, like you said, get up and try again. And now we're going to tweak it a little bit more. And it's going to be different depending on the human being that you're talking about. And so I think it's the same in recovery. Some things work for some people. Some things don't work for others. Exactly. Other there's nothing right or wrong about it. If it's keeping you sober and your life is improving, do it. Like there can't exactly. be one way. And I think that's part of the separation, whether it's this monotheistic approach or political, you're either this or you're that, or there's yeah. this, or there's that way. That's, it's so old fashioned because we are so much yeah. more nuanced than that. Um, and even in recovery. And I think, you know, I love everything you're saying because it all just really ties together and you can, you can really connect the dots. And, um, I used to think that, um, when I was in grad school, when I was working on my MBA, we were introduced to Dan Daniel Goldman's work on emotional intelligence. It was the first time I had ever heard of that. Um, and I just thought it wasn't anything that could be taught. I, I was like, you know, learning IQ stuff. Yes, you can learn and you can train your brain and you can do all of this, but you're either born with empathy or you're not. You're, you're a nice person or a sensitive person or you're not, you know, I didn't really understand that EQ was something that you could teach or that you could coach or maybe even take a completely narcissistic leader and help them evolve into someone who can think about someone other than themselves, even if it's for the greater good of the company, be it the bottom line or whatever it is. Right. But how do you teach EQ? Like what, how, what is that? Because that to me, that's a feelings thing. And so yeah, how do you teach? Yeah. So it's a great question because, you know, to your point, it, in an either or society, which we're in right now, yeah, we have to be, we have to be the and. Mm. So, so how are you the and, right? And, 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 and you think of the word and it's a connector. It's not a wall. Right. Um, it's not rigid. So, so EQ, when I'm approached with, 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 you know, even, even the term teaching it, it's experiencing it. 
is how I look at it. Right. We can teach it all we want. We can, we can, we, to your point, we can go through the, the incredible, the incredible body of knowledge that's out there and, and Daniel being the first and foremost of that and the, the stuff that has come out afterwards. Absolutely. So we can become aware of it, but then we have to like take action on it because EQ, it's not so much being taught. You have to experience it. And that's where it requires us stepping out of a lot of times for myself when I'm, when I'm, when I'm looking at, looking at introducing an EI EQ framework, it's looking at the whole person and their life. You know, there, there, there would be few and far between individuals in their lives that have not experienced something that would become close to vulnerability that would come close to humbleness, that would come close to empathy, that would come close to something in their life, somewhere in their journey. Right. And if it hasn't happened to them or they've blocked it off in such a way with either or and they can't bring the and in yet, then there is somebody close to them that something has happened to. Yeah. So what I do is little by little, I focus on the life experiences of, of individuals that take them out of the, a lot of times the corporate confines, because to your point, you said earlier, when we go into the corporate world, we, we, you know, we don't bring our full self. We bring a facade sometimes yeah, and we bring an avatar of who we are. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I take us out of that a little bit and I bring us into, I bring us into sort of the life experiences, but even in a corporate, a corporate environment, even in a corporate framework, Usually one of those leaders that you just talked about that, 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 that is full of nar narcissism and full of like me, 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 and, and it just leads with ego to the point where they're blinded by everything. Usually there is something that has happened to them mm -hmm. in that trajectory that has, they felt unfair about, they felt mad about, they felt angry about, and those are emotions. And sometimes I will latch on to that because that becomes the segue. It's the way in. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the way in. It doesn't yeah. mean it's automatically going to lead to empathy, automatically going to lead to a vulnerability. But there's emotion. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking right. about using the intelligence of your emotions. And so... I, I don't know anyone in the corporate world, especially those leaders that you just kind of <laughs> framed that have not experienced the frustration, the anger, the blame. And then what they do is their reaction from fear is to point it elsewhere. But right. first they have that reaction. And that's what I latch on to is before they, before they, before they do any of this or point or it's, it's this up here. Right. What's that initial thought? And most, most of the folks that I've worked with on that can get into and, and, and delineate that. Yeah. And then there's your linkage in. It's like a question of like, okay, hold on a second. That's your visceral reaction, but like what's underneath that? And if someone's willing to be honest and to, to, to kind of be with their feelings for a second, you can, because when I act out of character, typically more so in my personal life, it always comes from a place of fear. If I, if I examine that behavior later, yeah. I'm like, Ooh, I was scared. I felt threatened or, you know, but yeah. it was, those are those. And there's this pause now, this buffer of like, Ooh, that was, that was a reaction I just had internally. And then the next question is always what's going on with me. What's, what do I need to take a look at? It's, a, it's like a form of self self-awareness, self-love, I don't know, nurturing my inner child, whatever you want to call it. But sometimes, but yeah. sometimes, I yeah. think, and I don't want to get into gender too much, but I think a lot of times, because it happens to women too, I can attest, but men especially are expected to just be, you know, tough and like lead with an iron fist and like all these, they don't want to be perceived as emotional or weak or vulnerable or, you know, and, and I see this sometimes in leadership and companies where they just send a mandate down. Hey, we're putting in this new software system. Our go live date is this, this, and this y'all better get on board. Yeah. Um, and guess right. who, those don't right. go well, those don't go well because it's not a mandate. It's a team environment. You can't make decisions in a conference room for people who are out on the floor doing the work and you've got no idea what's actually going on over there, right? This huge disconnect. 
Um, but, but that doesn't right. make that person bad. It doesn't mean they don't care about their employees. They're just looking at it through right. the IQ lens only. They're, they're looking at it through what they normally get recognized for and That's validated right. for. Yeah. That's it. And, 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 you know, to your point around the, the, the gender specifics, absolutely. You know, um, you know, in fact, you know, men have been known to use the term fearless. I'm fearless. Right. right. I'm fearless. It's like, what? Like, you, you, know, you, 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 you've never experienced fear? Like, what? Like, there's no such thing, you know? But if you, if you say that enough times, your ego will just, it, it, you automatically, it becomes who you are. Yeah. And so then you react. It's not that you're fearless. It's not that you don't have fear. You actually have a lot of fear the more you say you're fearless. But it's sort of like, to your point, that is, that is, um, in fact, it it, 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 even goes further around sort of the showing emotions, right? Now it's gotten, we've gotten better with, with, with some of that and, and, and we've, yes. we've, we've, we've opened that up more, but men for the longest time, don't be a cry baby. Don't cry. Don't do this. And you think about babies, think about babies. What do babies represent? They don't give a dang about anything. They go wherever they want to go. They poop wherever they want to poop. <laughs> they are so curious. They are fearless. Right. They get up. They're trying to get up and walk. They're curious. They scream. They want things. And then as we grow, we are normed away from all of that. Yeah. All of that, especially the pooping part, which is really, really you know, that's okay. But the curiosity the, the trying out new things, yeah. the showing emotion, even the ask. Babies, they don't necessarily have a language yet to ask, so they just scream or want something. Right. That's their ask. But then we get normed into, oh, well, you know, you shouldn't really, don't, don't ask for that. So we don't. Right. We don't ask for stuff. And then we become the adults that we become yeah. with all of the societal norms thrown on there. Yeah. And so then it's no wonder we have all of this stuff going on in our lives. And, 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 and some of us like myself turn to drink or turn to something else to mask some of those things. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, and, and to your point, it's like, we have been blessed with that ability to like, okay, wait a minute, I, I need to do something else here to yes. get out of this yeah, to become my full self. Because society will but, but, Society will shush those things out of you until you do become this little robot oh, yeah. that that's you know fits into all everybody's box and keeps everyone feeling really comfortable. And to me, that's what imposter syndrome is about. When I am not in alignment sometimes with who I really am, and I you have to hide so much of who you really are to try to be professional or be this or be that or make those people feel comfortable. Yeah, it makes you feel like you're not being yourself, and that's another form of it sometimes too. Yeah. And I think. Your, um, your podcast, the shaky voice, I, I want to end on this because I want you to leave us. I mean, sure. you've, just, you've shared so many amazing things. I could talk to you forever. Um, but you could <laughs> on how to use your, your shaky voice as a means to celebrate our growth and, and perseverance. Um, I consider myself pretty confident, generally speaking, um, in, yeah. in work settings. And I can't tell you how many times to this day that I didn't, I didn't raise my hand. I didn't say something in that meeting. Sure. I didn't push back or, you know, even though I knew that it was a, a valid thing to contribute, not that I was right necessarily, but it was a contribution that needed to be made and I didn't do it. And so because yeah. I was scared, because I was afraid of how people would react, or maybe I thought I don't know enough to be speaking on this topic. So how sure. do we, how do we, I don't know, overcome even when your voice shakes, right? Like how do yeah, we yeah, around that? Absolutely. It's hard. Oh yeah. So it, 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 it can, yeah, it, it, it can be very hard. And I look at it sometimes as like, okay, okay, what do I need to do here? It's like, and sometimes here's the key. Sometimes it's like, you know, I don't want to raise my hand right now. I don't want to. It's a, it's a conscious decision. So yeah. I flipped that into a conscious decision not to. Now, why did I make that decision? Is it because I'm avoiding something? Is it because I don't feel comfortable? Then I look at that, right? And so I kind of I peel that back with a little curiosity and like, you know, it, maybe I'm tired. Maybe it's like, I don't like these people. <laughs> like whatever it is. Um, but here's, here's what works for me. 
And so I, I don't like these people. I just want to get out of here as fast as possible. Right. right. So it's like, I don't want to raise my hand. I look at it three a, in the, with three A's. Um, and this is what has worked for me. And it's what works for my clients. First is awareness. Why are you doing what you're doing? Mm-hmm. You know, what is it that, you know, what's that awareness? And you, you nail it. You, you, Amanda, you nail it all the time through our conversation here. That awareness you bring into your life, that awareness of why you say what you say, that awareness of why you stay silent, that awareness of how I feel. Awareness is key. Right. So the awareness, oh, I'm not raising my hand right now. It's awareness. Then advocacy. Usually when we're aware of something that we're not doing or we should be doing, that's our judge. That's the inner critic. That's the judge. Well, the advocate, the advocate, our self-advocacy, like, wait a minute, I can see, I can do this. I can raise my hand if I want to. I can say that I can step into this. I can take that, but making sure that you have your own advocacy rhythm going. Mm -hmm. So it's awareness and then advocacy, right? And it's being an advocate for yourself because bottom line, you might have a great tribe and community and friends and family and everyone who are our advocates. Right. You've got to advocate for yourself first. Mm-hmm. The last A is action. So we can have all the awareness we want. We can have all the advocacy we want in terms of like, yay, I am who I am. But you got to take action. you right. got to take a step, whatever that is. Maybe it is the raising of the hand. Maybe it is the conscious decision to say, you know what? I'm not going to raise my hand. That is an action in itself. And here's why I'm not doing it. Maybe it is talking to that person. Maybe it is in the corporate world, as we all know, or in life, having that difficult, quote unquote, conversation. I, I love that term, managing difficult conversations. Well, guess what? If we call it difficult conversations, guess what it's going to be? It's going to be difficult. Yeah. It's managing a conversation. So you both have an outcome, right? Quit, get, get rid of the word difficult around, around that. But whatever the situation is in our lives, um, taking action, no matter how small, because no action is small. Right. Every action is big in its own way. It's that baby step. And then that goes right back to awareness. Oh, okay. Now I'm doing this. And so I always do that constantly. It's a constant kind of like circle for me. Awareness, advocacy, action. Awareness, advocacy, action. The advocacy part is really important because we could go from awareness right to action, but then we're not being an advocate for ourselves around that. We're not building ourselves up enough to do that. And so for me, that's what works. And that's what I have found that works over and over again. I love that. I love it because it's easy to remember and it makes sense and it goes in order. And I think that, you know, there are... um, there are times because I'm real big on, you know, assume positive intent and and, um, you know, yeah. check your motives and and making sure that I'm coming from a good place. But let's be honest, people can be mean there. People aren't always on your side. Oh, sure. People can be um, I don't know. And so that vulnerability, too, is a, a form of self-protection. I want to keep my job. I don't want to make the wrong person. Absolutely. And so I've noticed in some meetings and even some meetings that I facilitated and workshops and on business process and stuff of um, offering up the ability for people to communicate later outside of the meeting um, for for more introverted people or maybe people that aren't comfortable or maybe they need to go think about it for a couple hours after and then they'll contribute. Um, But yeah, that's a great that's a great. Um, I really, I, actually, I really appreciate you doing that in terms of allowing people to come back later. I'm, an, as I mentioned, I'm an introvert, and I can't always in meetings. You know, taking me back to the corporate world, I might have something to say, but I have to process it first, and I couldn't always speak up. And I used to get in performance reviews. I remember, you know, manager saying. You need to speak up more. You need to speak up more in meetings. And it's like, well, the meetings are like 30 minutes. I can barely process the information that's coming. I, what do you want me to say? And I would always have some good ideas. I always gave myself credit for that. But I couldn't always like formulate what it was all the time. Right. And to your point, I don't want to raise my hand and then look like that. And that, that was my own imposter syndrome or my own whatever. But I really appreciate it. When a facilitator, a leader, a team lead, a colleague, a peer would always say, hey, come at me later on if you got an idea. Yeah. It would give me a chance to settle it. And then think about it. Think about, think about what you just did, Amanda, what you are doing when you're doing that. You are allowing other ideas to flourish versus stifling the ideas. 
Right. So many times people walk out of a meeting room and the best idea was never said and will right. never be said because so, it was because for yeah. whatever reason. And some of the best, first of all, it's not like when that meeting's over, the ideas or the processing stops, it's actually just beginning. But the other thing is some of the quietest right. people in meetings are the ones with the best ideas, the best suggestions, the right. best feedback, but they're never going to raise their hand because they're introverted and they are anxious and they would rather send it in an email a couple days later. And I never realized that until people, I was vulnerable enough and they would give me feedback and I would share about how I had withheld because I didn't want to be embarrassed or feel anxious. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are, those are things that I've definitely, um, learned. And it's, again, it's crazy to me. Sometimes people who dominate the conversation in a meeting, they're, they're contributing absolutely nothing. Meanwhile, the people who actually <laughs> have something to say are too shy to say it. And so it's just, you've got to, and you can see it in people's eyes. You can see that they want, that they have input. Um, but just because you're yeah. not an outgoing yeah. extroverted person doesn't mean you don't have something to contribute. So I wish we did more to protect yeah. introverts and to make them feel comfortable in, in giving their contribution. Same in, same in recovery meetings. You know, there, yeah. there's plenty of things that people need to say. And I've had sponsees who will talk to me for three hours straight without taking a breath, but they won't say a word in a meeting. Right. Right. So yeah. it's, yeah. they've got to yeah. have the space to be able to do it, you know? So, yeah, it's kind of funny. You mentioned the recovery meetings. It takes me back 30 plus years, but I never thought sometimes my story was good enough to share. Yeah. So my imposter syndrome came in play there in in, in a a crazy, you know, like how crazy is that? But it was so true. And I'd sit there and listen to these people's like, to your point, all these stories. And I'm like, well, I, I don't, I don't have that kind of drama or I didn't have that drama. The drama is within and, you know, or, and and so you're absolutely right. The world, we, we become an either or almost exclusionary world right now. Yeah. Um, so to be a little bit more inclusive and to be that and really can bring in all of the different thoughts and all of the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful ideas that people do have. So that's, that's I think, what, what you're doing is incredible. Well, and I think, too, that um, sometimes if you have the less dramatic story, somebody who's sitting in that room deciding if they want to get sober or not, they're they're doing the same thing, listening to all these crazy drunk logs and they're like, I don't belong here because I don't relate to that. And then if you share right. your boring story, now they found someone they can identify with. So that may be you sharing may be the reason that someone else decides to take the journey of recovery. Like so those are the things that, you know, when I'm being when I'm being scared, um, I have to remember that if I say this, even though it's going to be uncomfortable for me, it could potentially help another person. And that's usually what will get me over the hump. Not always, but well, I have to thank you again, for, just for joining me and for sharing your experience and your strength and hope. And um, I know I've been made better for it and learned a lot and your enthusiasm is contagious. And I just, I am, I'm just inspired. So thank you. Oh, Amanda, thank you so much. This was absolutely wonderful. I just appreciate it. And I love what you're doing in the world. You, you are, you are creating these sparks in the world of inspiration and the, these wonderful sparks of courage and these wonderful sparks of, of people being able to, to really fully understand who they are. And that's what you're doing with, 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 with a podcast like this. And beyond that, that's what you're doing with who you are. Cause I can tell. So I just, Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you.